Hey, and welcome to Full Proof Theology. My name is Chase Davis, and I am your host. It's great to be with you here today. I'm here with Micah Caswell. Micah is a returning guest on the show. Yeah. So, Micah, thanks so much for coming back. Hey, thanks for asking me back, man. That's it's one thing to sneak in the first time, but uh, to get to come back, that's big. <laughs> well, <I'm laughs> Thank you for having have me. You. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just for my listeners, remind people your church, some of your background, a yeah. uh, little bit of that so they can kind of know where you're coming from. Yeah. Well, and even before that, thank you again for having me back. And man, brother, I'm a uh, I'm a fan of the show. I, I, I regularly listen and it has been very helpful for me to navigate. You know, these are complex times and crazy times. And, and I just really appreciate your voice. And, and I've learned a lot from the show. So so anyway, I, I'm thankful to be here and appreciate your work. Um, Thanks, man. I am the I'm married to Kristen, um, my seventh grade homecoming date. Um, so it didn't it wasn't solid all the way through to marriage. Uh, there were some you know, bits and stops there along the way. But uh, it is a great picture uh, that we still have and love. I, we have two kids. They're both teenagers now. So we're in that stage of life, which is fun and intense. And um, anyway, college is coming. And so we feel the burden, <laughs> burden of that and all that that entails. But uh, this is a good stage of life with our family and uh, really, really love our children and proud of our children and um, excited about who they're becoming. Um, I am the pastor. The main thing I do is I'm the pastor of Redeemer Church in Denton, Texas. And we're actually in our, our first kind of rented a facility, which is actually in Corinth, Texas, which is the next town over from the city of Denton. Um, but yeah, so kind of in the North Texas region. And uh, we launched that church in 2014. And it's really been a great ride. Um, you know, like all church plants, there's there's hard parts of it. And but um, and, and it's intense. You know, it kind of takes everything you have, uh, which is I love. Um, but it is it's a really it's a joy to be part of it. And, and I hope Church planters hear that like it's uh, church planting is hard, but man, it's such a great journey. You really get to walk with people, know people, um, watch something grow and take steps of faith. And, and it, we, we're in a great season and the church is growing. Church has doubled the last couple of years. So uh, that all sounds great, but it's been a lot of work and intense, but, it, but it's been a great, a great journey. So and then I work with um, our local Baptist Association where we've come together. There's about 100 churches in it. And we've come together and uh, formed a, a church planting kind of assessment, cohort training, equipping, launching, put more money to it. And so I coach uh, church planters uh, for a few hours every week uh, with that, which I really love. Uh, we, we, the Lord's brought some great dudes to North Texas to plant churches. So, yep, that's me. That's great. Are you still working on kind of uh, uh, teaching high schoolers? Is that something you do as well? Worldview education? I do. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, are this kind of the way we you know, get our kids to the Christian school is I, I teach a, uh, a biblical worldview class at a local Christian high school that my daughter goes to. And I've done it, I think, seven years now. And it is it, it is one of my little joys and passions of life. Um, man, we I have so much fun with this. We catch them. At, it's their senior year. So there's all sorts of emotions and thoughts and they're about to launch and they've been in this Christian school bubble and testing ideas. And so it's, it is it is wonderful. I really love our students. And um, yeah, just just came from class to do this. So we had a great talk on uh, being inclusive and exclusive and how do we think through that. And um, they, our kids are my students are really smart and fun. And anyway, I love it. That's great, man. Well, yeah, one thing I love is that uh, it, Mike is a super humble guy. He's got plenty of degrees um, yeah. doing lots of different stuff. Jack of all trades. Um, one thing he's done recently though, that, that has really blessed me is you wrote this commentary on the book of Micah. And we actually use this at our church. I'm going to drop a link to our series on Micah. And it was funny cause I kept, I, I bought about six commentaries. Um, Micah, uh, Caswell had asked me to read his book on yeah. Micah. And uh, I was just like, I kept coming back to it cause it's so easy mm. to read. It was so helpful, practical. Yeah. But it also had enough exegesis in there for me to keep it interesting. A lot of these yeah. kind of pastoral commentaries can just kind of give me a lot of illustrations mm -hmm. that I'm not really interested in from the 90s. Right. And so right. I really appreciated it. What inspired you, though? I mean, was it your name that you were just like, well, my name's Mike. I'll just write a yeah. commentary on Micah. What what kind of inspired you to write a commentary on Micah? Yeah. And then, man, thanks for using it. And, and thank you for the endorsement in the book. And I was very blessed to, to have your endorsement of it um, and even more blessed that you you found it helpful. Um, it is a homiletical commentary, so it's not a, you know, a grammatical, you know, doesn't go deep. But but um, really 
the the vision for it and passion for it was uh, this was connected to my uh, doctoral project at Southern Seminary, where I was really doing a deep dive in Christocentric preaching and interpretations, Gradanus, Goldsworthy, that world. Um, and then trying to think about a genre where maybe that's hard to navigate um, with some of those hermene hermeneutical principles. And so um, I, I went into Micah. And of course, with my name, I'd always you know, wanted to do work on Micah. Uh, the, the title of the commentary is terrible. It's called The Gospel According to Micah, and it is not like a manual to a cult that I'm starting. Um, <laughs> but I promise you, as bad as it is, all the other titles were worse. Uh, but it, it's a great title in the sense that really the uh, the the project of it or vision of it is, you know, the subtitle is it's a, it's a Christocentric commentary. So I'm really trying to um, uh, discover Christ. You know, how do we see Jesus? How do we uh, mine the gospel out of this particular minor prophet? And so that's kind of the the angle of the book. And, and really probably the you know, why it's worth getting is I, I kind of lay out how to how to preach Christ from the Old Testament, make a case for Christocentric preaching and um, and then model it, you know, in the in the actual commentary. But anyway, so, so there's some tools in there that I find helpful as a preacher and, and pastor. And so hopefully that's helpful for people, too. But, yeah, part of it and I want to give it away. You have to buy the book to know the whole thing. But um, I did have. I kind of open and close with an illustration on my name that I was in high school before I knew somebody else named Micah. Um, okay. And so I, my parents at a little Christian bookstore bought a little plaque and gave it to me as a gift that had the meaning of my name, which was one who is like Jehovah. And so I always took that as a, as a uh, statement and a challenge to live like God. And, and it became a real duty thing. And, and I, I think in a healthy way overall. Yeah. However, I think really what Micah's parents in the Old Testament were doing with his name was something slightly different. I think it was more of a question than a statement. And that's kind of where I land with, I think Micah 718 is helpful, you know, on that. And so I think it's actually more gospel grounded than a challenge to moralistically live by God, but something that is more, uh, more grounded in worship and, mm. you know, and, and really grounded in the gospel. So anyway, that's, that's in there. Then that was part of my interest. That's great. Uh, Micah seven eighteen. Refresh me on what that passage says. I'm looking for my Bible on my desk, and I don't. No, have yeah, it you're okay. Sorry, that was that's a super um, deep dive into it. But Micah seven is is the final passage, and what some commentary and what I kind of make a case for is this kind of functions as a bookend. You know, it opens okay. with Micah, quick statement of who he is, and then it goes into it. But in 718, it says, who is like God? That's kind of how 718 opens. And what I think is what is going on there is that's a question. Who is like God? And the answer is no one. Right. And isn't isn't God glorious that no one is like him? And so what I and what I think that. Micah's parents and what I think he's doing there in that sermon and in, in the book is saying that, listen, the name Micah is not about go be like God. It's really saying no one's like God. He's so glorious. You're never going to be like God, but isn't that great? No one's like God and let's just worship him. And so I mm -hmm. think I think that that's the good news of Micah is not go be like God. The good news is, is what's glory and, and marvel in this one that no one is like God. That's great. So okay. now you don't have to buy the book. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a similar experience with my name being Joshua. It, it, in thankfully, you know, it, it means the Lord of salvation. So there was never as much duty, you know, that it's hard to live that out mm -hmm. as a duty if you're already admitting that you need salvation. Uh, but I think people in our day, you know, it's very uh, popular to just pick a cool name. But I love having names that that mean something yeah, me too. connected to history or have some biblical meaning. I, I think that's great. Sometimes I'll, I'll find uh, Christians in my my church will bring their kids and they got these random names uh, from the Bible and yeah. names that I've never heard of. And, uh, yeah. and I delight in that. I think that's really fun. Well, you know, as someone picks up this commentary and I really would encourage everyone to do it. it the reason I love it is it's relatively short um, compared to a lot of commentaries that I pick up that are doorstops. It's very readable. It's personal. You obviously are a pastor and you care about people understanding. Um, 
you know, as, as people consider like you, like if you're a listener, you could go read Micah this afternoon. I mean, it's not, it's not yeah. like John or revelation or one of these long, longer complex books or Leviticus or what, what should people know if they're going to pick up Micah in the Bible, they're going to go to Micah. What, what should people know? Maybe background or just context of uh, Micah so that they can better mm -hmm. appreciate when they get into this kind of prophetic literature and the, and they're mm -hmm. hearing all these strange talks about nations and judgment and these kind of yeah. things. What are some key elements that, that you think people should know about? Well, first off, and is you're right on your comment that Micah is, is a great reading unit, teaching unit, preaching unit. Um, it, he's, uh, he's a contemporary of, of Isaiah. Okay. There's a lot of themes that overlap. Um, and, but man, Isaiah is hard. I mean, you know, it, that's a long book to preach and teach just to keep your people engaged with it. You know, I, right. I in fact, if I were to do it, you know, I, I, we've done, we've done Isaiah in pieces and we haven't finished it, but I, for me in our congregation, I think that's the best way to do it. But, but Mike is a little bit different. You can do the whole thing in, in the fall, you know, as you think yep. through a preaching calendar, you can do it easier. You can, it's a, it's a great book for a Bible study. It's a great book. Like you said, on personal reading, you can sit down in an afternoon and read it. Um, and so I think that's part of the, I think the appeal of it pastorally, um, the things that you need to know about it is that it is, it is prophetic. It's a, it's a, he's a minor prophet. So he's one of the prophets. Um, and one of the, I think key principles on understanding prophecy is, is there's a, there's a, there's prophecies that are foretelling and forth telling. <laughs> so there's some prophecies that are like predictions about the future. And then there's another category of prophecies that, that really are what we would call like rebukes, like there's an injustice and the prophets are rebuking it. So it's less like these prophecies like, you know, Micah 5 is, you know, is a messianic prophecy about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. That, that's kind of a, a this prediction about the future. But most of the book of Micah, consistent with the other prophets, is it's not it's not predictions about the future. It's really rebukes about sin and injustice. And so I think those are helpful categories to engage it. That sometimes people are like, man, this is going to be this big debate on, you know, end times, you know, stuff. Right. And sometimes it can be, but it, but really the majority of prophecies are more in kind of that dealing with injustices. Um, the other things that I think are helpful to know are uh, this is in, you know, divided kingdom period. This is King Hezekiah period, which I love. I'm talking about crazy name for kids. I Man, I've. I made a real, I made a case for our first son, our son. What about Hezekiah, honey? And she shot that down, but um, <laughs> love King Hezekiah. And so in some ways you could say Mike had a successful ministry because I think he influenced Hezekiah, but, mm. um, but yeah, th those are, those are some, and in the commentary, I do give some kind of uh, pointed, you know, quick information on the context of the book time period and what's going on in Israel and, and all of that. So that's great. The, uh, the thing I loved about preaching through Micah was, like you said, it, it's pretty simple to walk through it in 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I think we even did it shorter. One of the considerations we have, and maybe if you are if you're go to the Well Church, you know this, is that uh, 2020, 2021, we started going, and even 22, we started going pretty heavy in the paint on like speaking on cultural matters, especially yeah. uh, trying to mine the scriptures for how we should think biblically about uh, issues in our world to try to equip people. You know, as people are going to workplaces and college and and experiencing all these new ideas, uh, seeing commercials and, and just a lot of propaganda mm -hmm. out there. And so uh, we had we kind of had a good debate on staff because we decided to do Micah. And then right after that, we did a justice series mm -hmm. um, and people were like, is that too much? And I think it, it might have been. But the justice mm -hmm. series, like what I didn't want to do was make Micah address things inappropriately. You don't want to make the text yeah. say something that's not ready to say. We're not doing that. And so we did the yeah. Justice series right after we talked about economics from the Bible. We talked about okay. uh, race relations from the Bible, all that kind of stuff. But Micah kind of set us up. It really like set, paved the way for that. And what I've seen with Micah over the last few years and even growing up is like there's a lot of verses that you can just kind of pull from Micah to prove a point. A classic example in my mind as a Christian that I've seen uh, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I, as far as I can recall, there's there's a verse either in Micah about beating your swords into plowshares, right? Yeah, it's chapter four. But, uh -huh. Chapter four. But there's also in another prophet, there's an there's a verse about turning your your uh, 
swords into plowshares, and then that one's like mm -hmm. turning your plowshares into swords, right? I I think I can't remember if I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah, I, I don't know the the latter part, but yeah, the uh, that is a famous one of you know beat your swords into plowshares, which right. Um, and we can go there if, if you want to go there, but that, that's a great example of, um, you know, <laughs> what, well, well, one example is, is that that's actually the, that, that image is a statue at the UN. Um, and it's, and it's, was, I believe I, I should have double checked. I believe it was given by the USSR to the UN. So, I mean, that, that is an image wow. that was very much adopted by kind of atheistic communists it is, wow. a, you know, from the Bible. Yeah. Oh, here's where it is. Joel 310. I'll read the ESV. Beat oh, Joel 310 goes the other way. Yeah. Okay. Beat your plow plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks okay. into spears. Let the weak say I am a warrior. And so it, the reason I bring it up is because it's really tempting to use the Bible in a way mm -hmm. um, there's a way to use it appropriately. And so that's what I'm hoping mm -hmm. people buy your book and, and learn how to do that. Well, but it's really easy to put it on a meme and, and yeah. talk about social justice and say, see, the Bible says this. And the classic example for me was like reading Shane Claiborne when I was in my college years, mm -hmm. had long hair, and I was kind of into this uh, Anabaptist mood. And okay. uh, and those kind of verses were really appealing to me. But then all of a sudden you read Joel 3.10, it's like it says the opposite. And so it's really right. important you know the right. context and what yes. they're talking to. So tell me about in Micah 4. What is, you know, if you've got the USSR trying to adopt it, mm -hmm. what is what is it talking about there? Like, how should we understand what it's saying? Yeah. So and, and that really you're, you're touching on what I think. Well, I, maybe I should have said this better at the top. Here, but this was the real driver for me to do this commentary because of scenarios like that. And, and what I think helps give um, a Bible reader, average Christian as well as pastors teaching it the boundaries is a kind of a Christocentric interpretation of all of this. Put it in that, you know, Luke 24 road to Emmaus where Jesus, you know, tells uh, the two guys that he interprets all the law and the prophets according to himself. And so we're, I believe we're supposed to do the exact same thing. We're to interpret all of this according to Christ, the Christ event um, and, and I explained the seven, the Gradanus, the seven ways to Christ in there, um, which I find helpful. So what it does with a verse like that is it helps you interpret it, but really apply it. So so I'll pick on the, you know, the Soviet Russians, you know, on this, that they could take a verse like that and and use it to say all sorts of communistic, socialistic things that I don't think it at all means. And the reason why don't think it means those things is because um, that, that we're to interpret any passage according to its broader biblical theology, which is Christ in the gospel. Hmm. So, it, so, you know, so yeah, I was a little more prepared to go with Micah 6, 8 and, and to frame some of that. Um, that's fine. Let's go there. Let's but, go to but Micah yeah, 6, 8. But, yeah. Okay. So, you know, in Micah 6, 8 is one of the little gems in the book is in, in Micah 6, 8. I mean, this is the most well-known verse from the book of Micah. And there's, a, there's, there's really three well-known, but this is the most well-known because I think it's the best summary of the gospel. In fact, I had a, a sweet girl, one of my students a couple of years ago, give me a coffee mug at Christmas and said Micah 6, 8 on it. Yeah. But Micah 6, 8 is, he has told you, a man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? And then he lists these. Number one, to do justice. Number two, to love kindness. And number three, to walk humbly with your God. Now, many would say that that is the summary of the law. Hmm. Like that's, that is the summary of the law. If you want one verse on the law, that's what it is. And, you know, that's, that's how we're to live. Now, where it can be, I think, hijacked is, man, you can cherry pick, do justice. And then you can say, okay, evangelicalism has this long history of not doing justice, disen disengaging from things. I think you make a fair case on that in some degrees and some degrees you can't. But then I think justice is we ought to raise the minimum wage from, I, I don't even know what the minimum wage, what is it? I don't even know what it is, by the way. $20. Seven, yeah. Seven, seven fifty. 750. <laughs> my to, wife knows. It's yeah. A lot yeah. Right now. It's like okay. 15. Yeah. My son gets paid a lot at the, the <laughs> restaurant. But yeah. The, um, 
but you know, like, like that means that we ought to provide a $70,000 a year living wage to someone. Mm. Mm. Well, okay. I, I don't know that it means that. Now maybe it means that, but I, but I would disagree with that personally. I don't think that it means that, but really even more importantly than picking it to kind of advance something that is maybe as political in nature, maybe it's a true injustice, but then going to, but yeah, but do you do justice in ways that is loving and kind and walking humbly with God? Now I would, I would argue that, and, and, and hear me, I think that's very difficult to do. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's hard for me to disagree with people in ways that are loving and kind. It's hard for me to try to advocate justice and things that I agree strongly about while I'm walking humbly with God. But that is the gospel ground of it. Hmm. So and that's the real era of Soviet Russians you know, picking my go for on a deal. They don't even believe in God like they don't even right. they're not walking humbly with God. So right. there's so first off, they're doing it in their own strength. They're not doing it in the power of God. They're not repenting and believing. So there's no gospel ground to it, number one. But also, were they doing it in ways that were loving and kind? Right. Man, the, I think the Ukrainians in the 1920s, and <laughs> they would disagree because a million of them were starved to death by them. Yep. Uh, so I, sh I don't think that's loving and kind. I think mean tweets are not loving and kind. I think, you know, the, the harsh, abrasive tone of our day politically is not loving and kind. So I've... Anyway, that's, I think Micah 6 a the details of that verse, interpreting it according, you know, to its broader context, including the gospel, I think gives some healthy boundaries and bumpers to talking about issues of justice. Should we do justice? Yes. Yes. But how we do it matters. Yes, how we do it. And then do you connect it, just because it's been a while since I preached it, um, do you connect it back to God's law in order to kind of uh, exposit how does God define justice or, or, um, you know, I, what I don't want to do, and yeah. I made a joke on, on Twitter, uh, a couple of years ago, cause I'd never heard the word theonomy in seminary. I'd never, okay. that wasn't a, a thing, but you know, for a lot of my friends in the more Presbyterian tradition, it was like a mm. huge debate. There's kind of a famous Greg Bonson video where he's at Westminster Escondido and he's, uh, he's, he's speaking and kind of defending himself and he goes, theonomy? Theonomy, that's what you guys are concerned about while the world is going crazy. You guys want to mm. attack theonomy. And I, mm. I, I, I kind of love that. I, funny. you know, I enjoy yeah. that, but theonomy has a, a natural appeal to people, more conservatively minded Christians who want to take God's word seriously, who want to study yeah. it and who want to kind of look at the old Testament as the blueprint for how society should be governed and that kind of thing. So where do you think when, when Mike is saying do justice, is he assuming that his audience knows how to define justice. Like, cause we talked about the how with the, with the kind of like mm -hmm. approach, like the loving kindness and even the personal gospel application yep. also very uh, applicable, true. Of course, is there room in that text in your mind to help Christians understand from God's law, how he defines justice? What would you do with that? Yeah, I, I think there is, I think you've got to be careful with, and of course I, I just come from more of a, a Baptist tradition and I love separation of church and state. <laughs> you know, I, I believe strongly in it. Um, but it, you know, because like, uh, like Roger Williams said, you're, you're protecting the garden of the church and the wilderness of the state. Um, now we've, the, the modern American has it flipped, but, um, but what, what I would say is yes. I, I now part of what, you know, what you have to do with a book like Micah is who's its audience. And it is, uh, it is Israel, you know, it, like it is, you know, Old Testament now, and I'm a progressive dispensationalist. So, you know, I put, and I, I adopt a lot. I mean, progressive dispensationalist for me is a, is a coward's way out because I, I love so much in covenant theology too. But what, what I, I just think you have to be careful on what, who are the people of God, um, yeah. you know, and, and comparing that to Old Testament and New Testament. But I think what it does is it does it does give those boundaries. But you but we do have to understand that we live in a pluralistic society. Um, but but and, and I don't think all those are clear. Like, I think, um, you know, there are clear things, uh, uh, exclusive things with regards to sexuality in the Old Testament. Right. Um, and, and I think that anything that is stated in the Old Testament, we should view as sinful. I don't know that we should be pushing for the type of punishments, Old Testament punishments on something like 
I don't think we should stone people to death on certain things. Like, um, so that's where, and now some of that for me is, is functional. I think, um, just, sure. it, it would never happen pragmatic. anyway. So right. yeah, it's pragmatic, but, um, but yeah, but, but, but part of that is, is yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's a coward's way out, but <laughs> I, I, I'm up. I, I just think you have to put some real boundaries with it. Yeah. I think that's where I was getting, I was interested as a preacher, uh, you know, trying to explicate for people the difference between God's justice and God's way of doing justice and mm-hmm. how Christians should understand issues of justice. Cause you brought up great examples of minimum wage economics, um, even punishments for, for crimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity there to help Christians grow in their worldview on, yeah. you know, what does it look like? Like, a, that's a great example. Was God, was God morally unjust or was it wrong for God to, uh, you know, make those consequences, those punishments for crimes? Was that wrong? Well, of course we'd answer no, God is never wrong. Correct. And so Correct. it really, I, I love this. But then topic. why, you know, yeah, part, part of the question is why? Well, and, and because I think the people of God, th- there's a difference in probably the, um, uh, who who are the people of God? Like who, the, the audience is a factor in that to some degree. Yeah, the, it really gets interesting when you because a lot of the people who would either identify self self admittedly as a Christian nationalist, um, they actually don't embrace theonomy, and then a lot of theonomy mm-hmm. guys don't embrace Christian nationalism, and so there's an intramural debate going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's people calling the Puritans theonomist. You know, there's people calling mm-hmm. the Puritans theocrats, and mm-hmm. uh, and so I'm really curious about this stuff because I do think our, our world is so confused um, because the Bible's been hijacked and the Bible has been kind of, and I think you, the, the Soviet Russia example is a good example and an atheistic secular world government uh, ha- has no spiritual ground. And so they have to, they're looking to use God's word against uh, other people and to weaponize it against other people to control them and to uh, diminish the authority of God's word. What a wicked thing to do. Yeah. I, I think there's so many corners on the progressive left that l- love do justice, but don't love, love loving kindness and don't love humbly walking with God. And I think, um, I, I think what happens there is when you take the soul out of these problems, walk humbly with your God. Like, well, we don't have a soul. We're just animals. Yes. Like if you, if you were to go that far, like that's why so many of these attempts at justice don't work and they don't, they don't actually produce justice. Um, I had, a, we worked um, with some impoverished communities when I was an outreach pastor in Houston. And, you know, one of the real convictions that we had was the importance of, you know, what is the role of character and spiritual development play in someone climbing out of poverty. And so we created what were called individual development accounts where people would give money to someone who would match funds, but they had to meet certain, certain things that were designed to kind of build character, build those spiritual muscles of new habits and those things. So it was sensitive to the reality of people having souls and, and why spiritual development is linked to these external things. And, and it worked as a result. So anyway. Yeah, I think that's a, that comes into parenting, too, when you're trying to you know, <laughs> yeah. treat your kids just as as little kind of like beings, like a, like you would an animal or something. Um, yeah, that's right. And you, you have to remember the character matters. And I think, you know, honestly, when, before I had kids, there was something I was really opposed to in my mind, uh, as most parent p- people who don't have kids are. <laughs> There's like they're very idealistic. Yeah. And it was like, I never want to reward my kid for reading the Bible and, uh, or I never want to incentivize positively incentivize. And what you're left with is negative incentivization, you know, punitive, uh, yeah. kind of like withholding, but I think there's a positive way to help people develop in, in whether you call it a reward system or not, but it's gotta be grounded in the gospel. Um, yeah. what do you think that looks like? I mean, you talked about your example down there. How does that look like to <laughs> your, your, uh, a counselor as well? What does it look like to help yeah. people grow in, in character, caring for their soul, uh, keeping yeah. that kind of stuff in mind? Well, I mean, I do think they're, you know, kind of the shepherding child's heart. 
idea is really helpful there that, you know, walking them through it, explaining it. Uh, now we, we spanked our children, but then we would talk about it. Now, and sometimes, you know, the older I'm getting, you know, I always remind parents, yeah, sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta spank them. You don't have time to, you know, they're about to run in the street and you just gotta grab them and spank them and say, don't, don't you ever run in the street and scare them from running into the street. Right, yeah. Um, but, but even your example, like memorizing scripture, I, I, it's kind of a funny thought maybe, but, uh, early on we established in our children's ministry and our kids love it. Um, redeem our kids every month on a particular week is treasure chest Sunday around here. And basically what that is, is if you know your monthly Bible verse, your Mavatma, uh, then you get to get a prize out of the treasure chest. And I mean, we had whoopee cushions. I mean, we had, you know, of course. And that was a, probably a bad idea, but candy, I mean, it's candy in there. It's all sorts of stuff. It's, it's yo-yo. It's, it's fun. But, um, but we had some discussions early on, are we incentivizing it? And my response was, yes, we are. And, and right. I, I don't mind doing that because what's going on there is you're trying to get the word of God in their hearts and minds. And, you know, they don't know what it all means yet, but that, that verse is now lodged somewhere in there when they do need it. You know, they're going to be 19, 20 and experience something. And that verse is going to, oh, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> your Proverbs 3, 5 says da, 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 you know. Um, and so that's when it's going to be useful. So if it takes a whoopee cushion and candy to get it in there. I'm happy to do that. So yeah, I agree. I, I don't know if that's what you were going, but that's that's what popped no, in my I mean, mind was Treasure Chest Sunday. So that's exactly just, where I was going because that's. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Awana's culture and SBC. Yeah, that's a, yeah, and, we have uh, high numbers on that day too. Which, <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, it's just great. Yeah, <laughs> kids are begging to go to church. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, we go to church today. I, I used to hate that stuff. I used. I mean, like as yeah. a once I understood the doctrines of grace. Once I kind of like understood how the gospel works. I look, I look down on that stuff. Uh, yeah. And now as a parent, I'm like, no, uh, like, I'm so thankful. My mom took me to Awana's. I'm so thankful like Man, that they have little yeah. badges. Awana's is good for our kids. You know? Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think it's good. And, you know, for me, uh, that's, that's where I would even broaden it to be society. What are we incentivizing? What are we rewarding? Mm -hmm. What are we trying to not, not control people's souls? Uh, yeah. Not to, to over assume the role of either the state or other entities. But how are we promoting, you know, godliness in our society? Um, I, it's just an I, interesting I question. Think, I think what history proves, and I think this is consistent with the scriptures, not in the nation of Israel, of course, but when they're outside of it. When you have this pluralistic society where religious liberty is granted, and thus there's a freedom, actual, systemically, structurally, as well as culturally, to persuade people to your religion, have conversations, share the gospel over coffee, send a mailer to invite them to church, whatever that is, the gospel flourishes there. And, and America has been that. And the South especially has been that. Um, and, and we're losing that with the civil religion thing going away. I think there's good things about losing civil religion, but that's a negative thing. And so when they're, I think when Christians have the freedom, you know, to freely proclaim Christ, the gospel flourishes. I love to send you a, an article, uh, actually an interview is with Andrew Clavin and uh, Stephen Wolf. It just came out this week, mm -hmm. um, 15 minutes. So it's super easy. I'll put a link to the show notes as well. Um, and I, I, Stephen does a good job. He's been a guest on the show uh, of just kind of summarizing, okay, what is religious? If it, let's grant, let's grant your argument. Okay, and he does a really it's a brilliant yeah. way he argues in, in his book, Christian Nationalism, the case for Christian, because it's almost a bulletproof argument rhetorically, because mm. he semantically defines he defines his terms. He lays out his boundaries and then he proves his case. And it's kind of like it's really hard to argue with because he's defined the term himself. And so you really okay. it's, it's just hard to argue. But with that said, let's yeah, I'm not that. I'm not I kind of don't swim in those. I don't I don't know all the ends. And no, no, it's Christian and it's those fine. sorts of things. But yeah, but but I would say that, um, you know, I, I think and, and obviously and, I, and again, I don't know, Christian. So maybe people are saying this, maybe people aren't, but I, I, I would assume they're not. But obviously we don't want to like force conversion. Right. And so right. that would be unbiblical for a series of reasons. But um, but I think a, a Christian ethic that dominates a worldview I, I, uh, and a culture I think that's way more positive for the culture downstream, including 
the number of people who are converted and go to heaven, like brass tacks at that level. But I think it also no doubt leads to more human flourishing, uh, no doubt. And so, um, you know, those are, those are factors in talking about it. So. Yep. Well, I've taken uh, enough of your time. You're a busy guy mm-hmm. doing a lot of great stuff. Uh, and I, I love the area you're in because I'm from the area you're in. And so I'm so thankful you're there ministering. Where can people pick up a copy of your book? Yeah, probably the, the main place would be uh, just Amazon. Um, and you can obviously search with my name, Micah Caswell, and or the Gospel According to Micah, and you'll find it. Um, they've, they've got it on their deal where you can get in a, a day or two, which is fun, but uh, it's on Kindle where I read everything in Kindle uh, now. So you can yeah. download it in Kindle, but Amazon's probably the best way to grab it. That's great. And then if people want to hear more of your thoughts or keep up with uh, any other books you write, is there a place that I can direct people to your church or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, our, our church is uh, redeemer um, and we, you know, anything that I uh, blog articles and things I've, I, I post up there and of course the preaching ministry of the church. Um, and I have a, I do have a little website, micacaswell.com and there's uh, some links to, I've written another book and a few articles and, and some journal things. Um, and those can kind of be linked there, um, and, and be found from micacaswell.com. But yeah, thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming on the show today, Micah. Blessings, brother. Appreciate it. All right. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it. If you share it with a friend, uh, send it to somebody that you think could, uh, could benefit from reading Micah. And really just share with anyone who's interested in getting into the book of Micah, read it this afternoon, dig into God's word and really enjoy um, uh, Micah Caswell's commentary on it because it's delightful. It's readable. It's really enjoyable. Go pick it up. Uh, We'll be back soon with some great guests coming up. We've got Patrick Downey writing on Divine Comedy. Uh, We've got, gosh, I'm Alex Kochman, I think is his name. I may be saying that wrong. Uh, here in a few weeks with uh, talking about missions and contextualization. So we got a lot of great guests coming up. And if you would, head over to the link, the Patreon link. Uh, sign up there for any dollar amount that helps bring the show to you. It helps kind of keep the, the lights on here uh, to keep great content coming your way. We'll see you next time.